Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and tonight we are going to read a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, Life and Death, The Oval Portrait. He is alive and would speak if he did not observe the rule of silence. And that is an inscription beneath an Italian picture of St. Bruno. My fever had been excessive and of long duration. All the remedies attainable in this wild Apennine region had been exhausted to no purpose. My valet and sole attendant in the lonely chateau was too nervous and too grossly unskillful to venture upon letting blood, of which indeed I had already lost too much in the affray with the venditti. Neither could I safely permit him to leave me in search of assistance. At length I bethought me of a little packet of opium which lay with my tobacco in the hookah case, for at Constantinople I had acquired the habit of smoking the weed with the drug. Pedro handed me the case. I saw it and bound the narcotic, but when about to cut off a portion, I felt the necessity of hesitation in smoking. It was a matter of little importance how much was employed. Usually I had half filled the bowl of the hookah with opium and tobacco cut and mingled intimately half and half. Sometimes when I had used the whole of this mixture, I had experienced no very peculiar effects at other times. I would not have smoked the pipe more than two-thirds out. When symptoms of mental derangement, which were very alarming, warned me to desist. But the effect proceeded with an easy graduation, a graduation which deprived the indulgence of all danger. Here, however, the case was different. I had never swallowed opium before. Laudanum and morphine I had occasionally used, and about them should have had no reason to hesitate. But the solid drug I had never seen employed. Pedro knew no more respecting the proper quantity to be taken than myself, and thus in the sad emergency I was left altogether to conjecture. Still, I felt no especial uneasiness, for I resolved to proceed by degrees. I would take a very small dose in the first instance. Should this prove impotent, I would repeat it, and so on, until I should find an abatement of the fever or obtain that sleep which was so pressingly requisite and with, with which my reeling senses had not been blessed for now more than a week. No doubt it was this very reeling of my senses, it was the dull delirium which already oppressed me, that prevented me from perceiving the incoherence of my reason, which blinded me to the folly of defining anything as either large or small, where I had no preconceived standard of comparison. I had not at, at the moment the faintest idea that what I conceived to be an exceedingly small dose of solid opium might in fact be an excessively large one. On the contrary, I well remember that I judged confidently of the quality be, to be taken by reference to the entire quantity of the lump in possession. The por portion which in conclusion I swallowed, and swallowed without fear, was no doubt a very small proportion of the piece which I held in my hand. The chateau into which Pedro had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded con condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those fantastic piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned upon among their pennies not less in fact than the fancy of mrs radcliffe to all appearance it had been temporary temporarily and very lately abandoned day by day we expected the return of the family who tenanted it, when the misadventure which had befallen me would no doubt be received as sufficient apology for the intrusion. Meantime, that this intrusion might be taken in better part, we had established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay high in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry, and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies 
together with an unusual great number of very spirited modern paintings and frames of rich golden arabesque. And these paintings, which depended from the walls, not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks, which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary. In these paintings, my incipient delirium perhaps it caused me to take deep interest so that having swallowed the opium as before told I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room since it was already night to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of the bed and to throw upon open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself I wished all this done that I might re resign myself if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow and which purported in critique and described them. Long, long I read and devoutly, devoutly I gazed. I felt meantime the voluptuous narcotic stealing its way to my brain. I felt that in its magical influence lay much of the gorgeous richness and variety of the frames, much of the ethereal hue that gleamed from the canvas, and much of the wild interest of the book which I perused. Yet this consciousness rather strengthened than impaired the delight of the illusion, while it weakened the illusion itself. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty, Rather than d disturb my slumbering valet, I so placed it as to throw its ray more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture of all, unno all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl, just ripened into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent, even to my own perception. But while my lids remained this thus shut, I ran over in mind my reasoning for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to come and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting that I saw, now saw aright. I could not and would not doubt for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas that seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to startle me into waking life as if with the shock of a galvanic battery. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style <coughs> of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the back, the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly yet fantastically gilded and filigreed. As a work of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. The loveliness of the face surpassed that of the fabulous Hori, but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance, which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment, thinking earnestly upon these points. I remained for some hours, perhaps, half-sitting, half-reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait, at length, satisfied of the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. 
I had found the spell of the picture in a perfect lifelikeliness of expression, which at first startling, finally comp compounded, subdued, and appalled me. I could no longer support the sad meaning smile of the half-parted lips, nor the too luster, real luster of the wild eye. With a deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position, the cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view. I saw eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she is a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all lights and smiles and frolicsome, as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instrument, instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to betray even his young bride, but she was humble and obedient and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from, one, from hour to hour and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghostly in that lone tur turret whether the health and spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him, yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had had ren high renown, took a fervent and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her, who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak, and in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words as of a mighty marble, and the proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none in the into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work, and turned his visage from the canvas rarely, even to regard the countenance of his wife, and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sate by him. And when many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work, which he had wrought but in the next. While yet he gazed, he grew tremulous <coughs> and very pallid in the gas, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself turned itself, himself suddenly round to his beloved, who was dead. The painter then added, but is this indeed death? If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and be sure to stay tuned for more short stories uh, by Edgar Allan Poe.